Are you eating too much sugar? We've long known the causal effect of sugar on rotting your teeth, but does sugar also affect the organs in your body? Here to discuss how sugar affects your health is Dr. Gary Fetke. Gary, thank you so much for joining me today. Good, uh, great to catch up again, Stephen. Absolutely. We, we were just talking a few weeks ago. It, it, I think it was 2016, wasn't it, that we first connected ah. on this whole topic of um, sugar. You as an orthopedic surgeon uh, operating on people, um, you know, really at the end stage of disease and um, me as a dentist looking in people's mouths uh, and seeing the effects in, in dental caries. Um, but the story has really played out from there. But, you know, I really, uh, you know, I was really looking forward to kind of jumping in with you and kind of going through the backstory um, because there's so much, there, there really is a lot of progress happening in this sugar conversation, isn't there? So, you know, I thought for people that, um, that you know, w- weren't familiar with your work, um, you know, how, that you could introduce them to why an orthopedic surgeon is um, you know, talking so much today about sugar and diet in general. Well, I was hoping not to be talking about sugar anymore. I thought it was a no-brainer 10 years ago. Um, in my naivety, when I started talking about it, I thought, oh, look, everyone will understand this sugar thing. This is really you know, incredibly simple. Uh, sugar is detrimental to our health. And um, We'll be able to change hospital food and improve the quality of life for everyone and turn around diabetes and um, not having any idea of how much trouble I'd get into just for raising those issues. Um, so I, mean, I think most people, sugar is actually very simple. I mean, it's actually only two molecules. It's glucose and fructose. And we know a lot about glucose over, you know, the metabolism of glucose. It's in all of our biochemistry textbooks and the role of insulin and the maintenance of blood glucose levels. But the issue about fructose is it wasn't actually very well known. So my textbooks and arguably your textbooks actually go sort of fructose and then it just goes to fructose 6-phosphate and then that's about where it stops and nobody ever paid any attention. And it was only in 2010 that there was a really pretty well a definitive study or a, a, research done by a fellow by name, Luke Tappy out of Switzerland, where he described the biochemistry of fructose beyond what we just ingesting it. And it's quite complex and not surprisingly, Mother Nature is, is complex. But sugar in the fructose component is our, you know, the part which is largely converted straight to storage as fat. But along the way, it goes through lots of chemical pathways, which are quite troublesome. And then when you combine our dietary intake of sugar, glucose and fructose in combination over the last, and I'll actually argue now, 10,000 years, we've started introducing Western disease. So whereas I've been talking, I suppose where you, where you know I've been talking has really been the last 100 years in our introduction of more modern food, I think we can actually track it all the way back to the agricultural revolution when we started cropping and farming and collecting our seeds and our grains and increasing our carbohydrate intake. So that's my pathway. So it started with sugar and fructose, and I'm more about carbohydrates and the whole inflammatory process with our modern food cycle and seed oils particularly. I often call sugar and carbs the kindling of the fire and the, and the matches, the vegetable oils, the seed oils, the polyunsaturated oils. And when you put those together, you know, it's totally screwed with our health. And that's really what we're looking down the barrel of now. You know, but when we, I mean, you asked in brief where I came from, but I've, my life's become so damn complex in the last 10 years that I used to be an orthopedic surgeon and now I'm still an orthopedic surgeon, but I wear several different hats. And it's almost straight out of Dr. Seuss now, you know, which hat do you want me to wear in this conversation? But um, for a long, long time, I looked after most of the diabetic foot complications in northern Tasmania. And they'd come from near and far. And you know, my my clinic on a Friday was called Fetke's Effed Up Fructose Free Fungating Foot Folly Fridays. But I don't know what the I don't know what the effed up mean. Uh, so the and when I had these people in hospital. I was, I was trying to control their blood glucose, trying to control their infection, all of that sort of thing. And I'd go around at mealtimes and they'd been served ice cream. You know, breakfast was cereal and sugar and fruit juice. And But the thing which really got my back up is that they were being served ice cream. And I started investigating 
And the hospital food guidelines, which effectively unchanged now, are still recommending three up to three servings of ice cream per day, even if you've got out of control diabetes in hospital. And if you think that's crazy, that's exactly where I was coming from. I started raising that issue in my hospital. I started questioning the advice that was given to my patients, both by the system and then specifically by the dietitians in the hospital. Um, Belinda, my wife, suggested I should get on social media because of, you know, because this is a really strong message. And then I, that, you know, within within a within a three days of launching a website called nofructose.com and entering social media, someone from the sugar industry came after me. You know, started trolling. I had no idea about trolls at that time, but it was quite clearly a troll. And then within a few years, this message of an orthopaedic surgeon talking about the perils of sugar and the implications of that with out of control diabetes and particularly amputations. That brought me to the attention of the cereal industry here. And now in retrospect, you know, with documents that have been found over the last several years, I ended up being the only doctor in Australia targeted by the cereal industry here at, at the board level, Australian Breakfast Cereal Manufacturing Forum, the, you know, the CEOs of Kellogg, Sanitarium, Nestle, Freedom Foods, Food and Grocery Council sit down and have lunch together at Concord Golf Club every three months and they determine, presumably determine, you know, their direction of where they're taking the cereal industry for the next quarter, year. So we happen to have internal documents from those meetings. We've got briefing documents from that. I've put all this towards the Senate inquiry, so it's all there you know, on public record. And they determine direction, and they have, there's a document in 2014 saying that cereal sales are down in Australia because of the concepts of sugar, uh, the concepts of low carbon paleo. And the ABC MF were in a direct um, contractual agreement with the Dietitians Association of Australia to promote and protect the benefits of sugar and cereal. So here we've got the Dietitians Association of Australia who were heavily involved in writing our dietary guidelines in a paid contractual agreement with the cereal industry to promote the benefits of breakfast cereals and sugar. And in the midst of all of those papers, I was the only Australian doctor targeted for, um, for uh, active defence was the, the, the term there. With the names of reporters that were supposed to be, you know, you know they were going to work with, and some of those reporters wrote articles, you know, detrimental to, you know, my situation and my scenario. So very clearly, I was talking about sugar and biochemistry and what it's doing to my patients. And I often talk about this now, that what happens inside the cell and what happens inside the body with nutrition is biochemistry. It's the Krebs cycle. It's all there in everyone's textbooks. It's in, it's in the first 50 pages. It's not in the last 50. But what happens with nutrition outside of the body is all about politics, money, and significantly about religion and religion's influence, which has been shaping our dietary guidelines. So, I've, you know, we've, I started with the biochemistry because at a practical point, I get sick and tired of chopping into limbs which have got dead flesh on them. That sounds... I, I, I used to get cranky at people who were too fat including myself, I've lost 22 kilos. But I used to get cranky about people say, why don't you get control? You know, I'm trying to, I'm doing joint replacements um, on people who are too heavy. And I used to get cranky at them, but now I realise all of the influences which have been shaping, you know, everyone's been told breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Have your cereals and grains, and have your fruits and, you know, um, and fruit's all natural and fruit's fine for you. Well, in fact, it's nowhere near as fine as it's been made out to be. So where I thought I was making an argument in science and in health and in prevention, it's become all about politics. And that's, and that's you know, I think you started off saying we've made a lot of progress. I think we have made a lot of progress that you and I can talk about sugar and its perils now. But I know the Dent you know, Australian Dental Association back in the 1950s was canvassing very hard at government towards, you know, to, you know, reducing um, sugar, you know, consumption because of dental caries. But if you then look at it, the, the Australian, I think, I think it was 
think it was the Queensland Workers Union, um, heavily canvassed against that part, that position. By, and and the, the dentists in the 1950s were not politically savvy. There wasn't social media. And they got completely smashed with their message because of the, you know, because of the sugarcane industry. That was interesting. You know, if I look back to, you know, my education and, you know, understanding sugar and its role in dental caries, um, you know, it, it really did take, you know, that 2010 paper to really start to draw the lines as to, hang on, this is, this is a real connection, you know, between systemic disease and what we're seeing in the mouth. And, you know, dentists kind of jump up and down and, and, you know, I feel that we, have been ignored for a long time in that sense and but as you say you know and you're a real stickler for the inf for the information you know it takes someone with with such um dedication to go through the depth of uh knowledge there to understand this but it's only been a recent you know relatively recent progression that we've really kind of start to 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 paint this out can you help to um to for the lay um you know, the lay listener to help understand what, what is, so we mentioned glucose and fructose. When someone eats sugar, so for, um, you know, a person, you know, who is a little bit more, you know, trying to reduce sugar in their life, what is it actually, what are the two mo molecules they're eating? So the glucose and fructose, and what do we now know they do in their body? Well, I th it's glucose and fructose. They look very, very similar. Chemically, it's just really just one shift in some of the molecules, but they've got the same amount of carbon atoms, same amount of um, oxygen and um, and hydrogen there. So it, it, they're very similar, but they have completely different pathways within the body. The, there's when you eat glucose, it runs down one pathway. Fructose runs down another pathway, but there's a link pathway that in our modern diet, when you eat too much carbohydrate, too much glucose the body diverts it down the fructose pathway. And so that's the thing called the polyol pathway and we end up insulin resistant, which is what probably two thirds of the population are now. We convert nearly 30% of our carbohydrate intake, our glucose intake to fructose. And that's in some of my inflammation talks, which are online. If the, in simple terms, I like to go back to nature and describe it. So sugar, we know at a glucose and fructose level, gets stored, it has inflammatory processes that it travels down the path. But more, more importantly, it drives behaviour. And the fructose component is largely our, fat, our, our storage one. And if you look at that in nature, we'll see that at the end of summer, beginning of autumn, when the trees are starting to bear fruit, which is the only natural source of sugar, a possum or an animal will come through and it will strip that tree bare the moment the sweetness level goes up. And when it gets to that point, it will actually go on a food frenzy. It will just strip, it, it will eat well beyond its capacity, but it's a survival mechanism to turn it into fat for winter storage. And that pathway, that driving, that, that thing which drives behaviour is exactly the same in humans. So when you actually, I mean, if you want to eat sugar and if you want to eat fruit and you want to eat that in moderation, which is a term which drives me insane, I'll put it in inverted commas, understand that what you're doing is you're converting the small amount. That we only use a teaspoon of sugar in our bloodstream at any point in time of glucose. Anything in excess of that gets converted to fat. Now, whether or not it's a slice of bread, one teaspoon, which has got five teaspoons, of glucose in it, one will go into the metabolism, four into the blood, it will get turned into fat. Same thing with sugar, same thing with pure fructose. It's very hard to get pure fructose. It always comes in combination with glucose. So understand that it will drive behavior. And most and most people will know that if you get a, you know, a nice a cherry in summer, you know, ever tried to eat one cherry or just one grape, you can't, it actually, it's bright, shiny, it distracts you, it wants you to eat more than that. But it's actually the, the, the sugar in it, the fructose in it, that will drive behaviour. So in the simplest terms, I say to people, if you want to eat carbohydrates and sugar, understand that anything in excess of one teaspoon is going to get converted to fat. It's going to go down inflammatory pathways, but more importantly, it's going to make you hungry for the next several hours, which is what it does to the possum. 
Can you put that in, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of conversation about carbohydrates for sugar. You've, you've kind of described that it all breaks down to sugar in the body. So for a, a person looking to reduce their, um, you know, their, their total um, carbohydrate uh, intake, you know, what does it look like um, in terms, you mentioned a piece of bread. Um, what are the types of foods that are going to start spiking these um these, you know, and all in often in hidden ways uh, that is starting to spike these pathways. And a lot of people ask, you know, is fruit sugar okay? Is it the same? You've just described a natural process that humans, um, uh, you know, the human body undertakes as well. Is fruit sugar different? You know, a lot of people are asking this at the moment. Absolutely not. I mean, glucose is glucose, fructose is fructose. And just because it comes in a in a piece of fruit doesn't mean it that this changes goes down a different pathway. It travels exactly the same pathway. And um, you know, I, I get into a, you know, another layer of trouble when I start questioning the benefits of fruit. But the term "have your fruit and veg" was only made up in 1993 at a conference in the west coast of uh, the US, where they. Um, uh, got together, uh, the, the, can, the American Cancer Institute got together with 44 well-meaning uh, corporates in the US, food industry corporates, including Walmart and McDonald's, and they based their beginning of understanding, and the term five a day, fruit and veg, was literally made up at that time um, to try and prevent cancer. They went back and look at, looked at all that data, and they actually ba they based it on the wrong assumptions. And then there's actually been a wonderful study called the EPIC trial in the in the in the um, in Europe, which has looked specifically at the intake of fruit and vegetable on cancer incidents. And, and when reported in 2011, so 20 years down the track, it made absolutely no difference. So the term fruit and veg, happy fruit and veg, is a completely made up term, and it's been made up by the food industry. Uh, if you go back to pr prior to 1991, people used to go to their greengrocer. They never went to the fruit and veg section at the supermarket. If you chat to your grandparents, a piece of fruit at summer in your Christmas stocking here in Australia was a treat. An orange was a treat. It was put, in, and so therefore this concept of fruit being good for us. So nowadays, fruit, fruit is a major commodity. It's been bred to have higher sugar levels and lower fiber levels, which actually improve its transportability. Um, an apple's got the same amount of sugar in it as Coca-Cola. And a banana, depending on its ripeness, has a lot more sugar in it than, than Coca-Cola. Now, so, you know, Coca-Cola's 10% uh, sugar, a banana 16 to 24% sugar. It is exactly the same glucose and fructose that's hitting the system. It may come with fibre, you may have to chew it, and you may not get quite as much. But I say to people, if you want to eat fruit, and I have a few berries at night in a, in, a, in a granola and cream mix. But I know that that's going to then make me potentially hungry for the next six to eight hours. But the benefits of fruit have been far, far oversold to us. I mean, in nature, I always talk about what, what does a piece of fruit want? A piece of fruit wants us to eat it so we can propagate its seed. The, the fruit hasn't yet worked out that most of us drop that seed in a porcelain bowl and it doesn't actually, you know, become a tree and improve its life expectancy. But it, it's just so far overrated. But that's that, that's called marketing. But at a at a at a, at a chemical level, um, fruit is still sugar. So the, the very first thing about you know, trying to cut down your sugar is start becoming aware, you know, listening to, you know, you and me and other people talking about it, being aware that if it tastes sweet, it's probably got sugar in it. The carbs that we talk about, the bread, the rice, the pastas, they get converted into fructose and still have those inflammatory pathways. But essentially, every time we eat carbohydrate, we're getting converting, we're converting that into fat for storage. I think I might have lost you there for a second, Stephen. So at a, at a, at a, at a practical level, um, I often talk about this along a wood fire aspect. 
So if you've got a wood fire, you can put into it uh, kindling branches and logs. And that's what our bodies are. It's purely a wood fire that's after body fuel. And the chemical that the, the mitochondria in our body requires a thing called acetyl-CoA. And that can actually be equally sourced from carbohydrates, proteins and fats, the healthy ones. So we have essential proteins that we need, there are essential fats that we need, but there's actually no biochemical pathway that the body requires uh, to have um, uh, carbohydrate. So we, there is no essential glucose requirement in the body, there's no essential fructose component. So the glucose and the fructose to me are carbohydrates which actually are the kindling of the fire. You've got to put them in and out of the fire regularly, they burn quick and fast, they come under an insulin load and that insulin load um, uh, requires literally the fire door to be open and shut multiple times. Whereas the healthy proteins and the healthy fats, they are actually the, the, the branches and logs of the fire. And the wood fire will respond just just as easily to that, uh, that, that fuel source. So it is, and as I say, before the agricultural revolution, so before 10,000 years ago, for a couple of million years, we evolved largely eating healthy proteins, essential fats, just like they do in the animal kingdom. Uh, and it's only with the introduction. Yeah, Jeff, you're muted. Okay, we're back. I, was I, was I think I might have still, still been live through your disappearance. It, it was definitely still live. Apologies for that. We've had complete technical difficulties this morning, but um, we've managed still to, to pull out some of the story of, of fructose, but... I, I've just been... I don't know. Did you hear me at all? I, I heard I've the back end, yeah. I've just been talking about the fact that we've got... Our bodies are no different to a wood, to a wood fire, and a wood fire can, it needs kindling branches and logs, and our bodies require acetyl-CoA as the wood, and it can keep, equally be sourced from glucose from carbohydrates proteins and healthy fats and there is no single pathway which requires us to eat carbohydrate whereas there are essential new essential fats essential uh, proteins and our body and, and we evolved over a couple of million years without the requirement for seasonal carbohydrate um, so whenever anyone tells you you must have carbohydrates in your diet it's just complete nonsense so the moment anyone comes at me with that argument well i'm sorry that's a fail in biochemistry to you you know and the brain's being dependent on 130 grams of glucose per day that's a made-up number you know the five a day for fruit and veg a made-up number and that's the trouble with all this nutrition stuff when you actually look into it it's just a house of cards it just keeps falling over and that's why you know um my wife, Belinda, she said, look, myself, others, we're all going blue in the face talking about the perils of sugar and the biochemistry of the science. And she's now become the, you know, I call her the world expert on the vested interests which have been shaping our decisions. And so when you understand the politics, you go, okay, I understand. Yeah, I put something up on Twitter the other day about um, uh, when was the last time you went to the supermarket and didn't get hit by propaganda? Never, you know, you can't you can't go into the supermarket with you without you being marketed to. That's what's called super and market. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought of that. Sorry, it's just a random That's thought. A, yeah. it, was, it was good you shared. It was a, a light bulb moment, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, oh, super. Okay, I can feel a meme coming. I'm going to be on Twitter <laughs> before the end of the day. Okay. <laughs> I'm writing it down. Okay, before the memory goes. <laughs> I mean, as, look, as, as, as you know, I'm a bit distracted today because of uh, other things. Gary, it's you know the conversation goes so many places, but I mean the the great thing about um, you know as we talked about is that you know people are you know starting to become a little bit more aware that they are responsible for what they put in their body. Um, look, where do you see so? For people that are in the sickness cycle, so in your in your patients in the hospital systems, you know it, where they um, you know potentially surrounded by these foods. When we walk through the supermarkets, we're surrounded by these foods. Uh, you know, where do you start to uh, to try to help people move from these 
these um, carbohydrate laden diets, uh, you know, in terms of identifying foods and, you know, of, you know, we've talked about uh, obviously the, the nutritive factors of fat, but, you know, what would be your advice to, you know, because you see people at the very sick end of the spectrum. So, and, you know, what are some of the, you know, maybe, you know, hope stories that you've seen in your patients? Oh, I, I see them at that end of the spectrum, but I see them still turn around their lives. And I think the most fascinating, I use the term empowerment. When people actually start working this out, it, it's just completely empowering. They, they realise, hang on, I've got a lot more control of my diabetes. Like diabetes is a classic because you can put a, a, a glucose monitor on them and you can actually turn around your diabetes. You can almost put it into complete remission within one weekend if you want. If you don't put, I mean, diabetes is an inability to control the carbohydrate load that you eat. So if you don't eat carbohydrate, you don't eat kindling, you don't have diabetes. But, you know, in, in, in type 2, type 1 is a different, different issue, but not a lot. You can still get control back with type 1. So it's just, it, when you see these people, I see them, they come back, they're just empowered. I, I'll, I'll tell you one empowering story after I say, I've rewritten the dietary guidelines for the world. You know, I'm, okay, you know I'm brash and I'm just going to say it. But if, and so what I've said, because I think it can be summarised in one sentence, and I say, we should be eating fresh, local, seasonal, whole food, based on our environment and our cultural beliefs, reducing added sugar and processed food. And if we just analyse that through all those things, we've come up with a diet or an eating cycle which is fresh, low in sugars and carbohydrate, plentiful healthy proteins and, 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 and essential fats. It's a very simple message, but that's what that's what I'm on about. If you've got, if it comes, if it comes in a packet, if it comes in a cardboard box or a plastic bag and it has a label on it, don't eat it. That's it. And all if you do that, then you've moved away from a whole lot of processed food, chemical additives, high in sugar and carbohydrates, um, and, and and the seed oil. So if it, that, that's if you are going to put something in your mouth that comes out of a cardboard box or a plastic bag, which a lot of people on the planet need to do, look at the label, read the label, read the sugar content, read the carbohydrate content, and try and reduce both of those. If this oh, this is a very funny story, end of last year, um, uh, a lady a lady came into me. She was in her mid seventies. Her daughter was. Uh, um, uh, or what was is a paramedic so she's quite you know quite informed switched on and she'd been following this lchf low carb lifestyle that i've been talking about for a long time and her mother came in with arthritic shoulders arthritic hips a bit carrying a bit too much weight and on a you know on a little on a wheelie frame and uh she had bare bone in her shoulders and bare bone in the knees and she was struggling and her daughter sort of said gave me permission to give her both barrels of the shotgun. So um, that's a figure of speech to anyone in the US, okay? Was right. uh, you know, to literally have a good crack at her about her diet, her carbs, and she was drinking a bit of alcohol. Um, and I said, look, you need, effectively, you need two knee replacements, two shoulder replacements, you're in strife. You can do something about this. And anyway, she came in three months later she walked in, no sticks, no frame. She waved at me. She said, you're not touching me, Sonny. This is a two, and she's got bare bone in both shoulders, bare bone in her knees. And, she said, and she'd lost about 10 kilos over a three-month period. She was completely empowered. She'd lost her pain. She'd regained her mobility. And all she did was drop her sugar, her carbohydrates, and her, and her alcohol. So there, there, are, there are two things to add on to that. When you eat sugar and carbohydrates, your pancreas will secrete insulin. And that's the fat storage hormone. So there's some recent work that's come out of China earlier this year. So not everything that comes out of China is bad, okay? So this is a great paper. And it looked at the role of insulin in, in, and inflammation in the knee joint. 
Insulin is actually a highly inflammatory hormone. It drives a lot of inflammatory markers. And so when you reduce your insulin load upon your own body, which you've got complete control of today, reduce your carbohydrate intake, your pancreas will stop secreting insulin. My fasting insulin is very low. You know, I've had it tested. So, and all of a sudden inflammation drops down. Just out of, over, just like that, you've reduced inflammation. I've got many, many patients, you know, directly, and then thousands of people, you know, indirectly via social media who reduce their sugar and carbohydrate load. They immediately reduce their insulin load and their arthritis pains get better before they lose weight. In the, you know, weeks before they lose substantial weight. So insulin's got a central role there. The other thing which most people, again, it's just biochemistry. If you drink alcohol, it will switch off your ability to actually burn fat. So if you're trying to lose weight and you're drinking alcohol, you won't. It's the moment the alcohol goes. So another another story along that line is I've got um, a friend's wife who I knew was going low carb. They were doing absolutely everything well. But I knew she, but she came back and she said, look, I'm, you know, I'm struggling, to, you know, my weight's not changing. I said, look, I know you have a glass of red at night. So I said, just stop that. And she said, I hate you. I said, okay, well, just, I, I, just do it for me for a change. Anyway, so she came back three months later and she, uh, she said, she told me she hated me. And I said, well, what? But I said, you look great. And she said, I, I hate you. I haven't had a glass of red wine in three months. I've lost 14 kilos of weight and her pain was better. I've subsequently seen her. She stayed off the alcohol. She's lost 20 kilos of weight. Again, she was doing everything right, but the alcohol was stopping the thing. So I, I know everyone's got a starting point. And I always talk about this as people are on a journey. Life is a journey. We pay more attention to what fuel we put in our cars than we put in our bodies. And when you start paying attention to that, you start putting better and better fuel into your bodies. You don't know where you're going to go, how far that travel. So for me, I started with reducing my sugar intake. And you can either go hardcore or you can do that slowly. And then I realized I needed to reduce my carbohydrate intake. And then I realized I needed to reduce the seed oil aspect. And so that's, that's a 10 year journey for me. Whereas people can go hardcore at that right now, which is going called going you know, low carb LCHF or going keto, which is really reducing that down. So you can do it all in the one hit now and go through a few cravings. And, but it's okay to not get it right on the first day. Uh, again, I tell the story of our daughter, one of our daughters. She's um, um, been trialling this for some years. And she, she took her a dozen times to get it worked out. And now she's the mother of two two grandchildren, which are quietly playing in the back of the you know, of the house here at the moment. Um, they have all moved in because of the coronavirus and COVID restrictions. But you know we've got two beautiful grandchildren who are, are low carbing. They're not no carbing. You know they have got they have a little bit of fruit in their diet, and and but well not the baby not the baby doesn't, but the grandson does. But Kate failed. She'd bring up, say, Dad, I've failed. I've, I've been a total failure. I've just eaten, you know, a box of ice cream. I said, that's fine, darling. You're an adult now. So it, but she knew that she was making, she wasn't eating as well as she could. And then, so I didn't get it right in, in one day. It took me 10 years to sort it out. People with the knowledge and even with the right support, like our daughter, kept failing. So but she called it a failure. It's not a failure. It's just you're actually, you're on that journey towards trying to find out the optimal fuel for your body. Some people, it's about reducing gluten. Some people, it's about reducing sugar. Some people, it's about reducing the seed oil. Sometimes it's actually a, you know, a food allergy to dairy. But this concept of reducing sugar and carbohydrate and seed oils is applicable virtually to everyone on the planet because those three things, sugar, carbohydrate, and the seed oils, in the amounts that we're having, is completely unnecessary for our, met for our metabolic health. There's just no, no requirement for them in the amounts that we're having. They're there seasonally in nature for our well-being, you know, for, and to get fat for winter. But you know, there's no supermarket that's closed for nine months of the year at the moment. You know? 
it will still be there, won't it? Garrett, I, I know, I know um, um, we have to end the talk end soon. End I thought we'd just, you know, we've covered we covered metabolic effects of sugar um, quite, uh, you know, reason, you know, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of detail to it. We've, we've, we've just we've touched on the surface, you know. I I, I do that in my in. Oh, seen a couple of my talks, but my inflammation talks, my I think cancer talks as well. I go I go into that in greater depth with lots of pictures, and I, I, I like to aim my talks at the interested lay person or the introduction introductory level for a, for a health professional. The trouble is, I think most health professionals are actually at the lay level because we don't get any training in nutrition. That, that's right. It, it, it is a learning process. It really is. Um, you know, everyone's learning uh, out of all this. You know, you've mentioned research that, you know, it is barely 10 years old, you know, some of these very fundamental processes. So, you know, there, you know, there may be excuses in this for, you know, that we are, that we are not learning. Anymore. No, not anymore. No, <laughs> not really. Right. Yeah, that's no excuse. No, no more. Yeah, stop eating processed food, right? You put the wrong fuel in your car; it's not going to run very well. Just, I, I, it might have. I might have given excuses to people five or ten years ago, but if you're, a, you know, and, and I'll, uh, Tim Noakes is a good friend of mine from South Africa. Tim, and he puts it, and I'll, and I'll quote him again. I can't remember the exact words, but if you're a doctor now and you're still recommending a carbohydrate-laden diet to someone with diabetes, I think you're negligent. That's a big, bold statement because we know that you can turn around type 2 diabetes and give people back total control and empowerment just by what fuel they're putting in. And this eat what you want and have more drugs for it is completely unsustainable for health, the system. You know, we've got a COVID crisis at the moment. The greatest risk factor is having metabolic syndrome and we can turn that around in 12 hours by improving our diet. Now, forget all the drugs and that's that that is definitely very topical you know strengthening the immune system um you know can you talk a little bit about you know we've talked metabolic metabolically but you know how does you know insulin spikes and um and and eating of these processed carbohydrates affect the strength of the immune system uh, it, there's there's different white cells <clears throat> that run our immune system <clears throat> there's a big group called the lymphocytes and the lymphocytes <clears throat> particularly the t lymphocytes are the first line of defense against a virus and, and 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 the coronavirus so in society and now t lymphocytes are directly inhibited by alcohol so in australia we know 70 percent of people are drinking more alcohol which is not good sugar carbohydrate is converted in the liver by i think called the aldehyde pathway to alcohol <clears throat> and i've got good papers that look at the role of sugar both glucose and fructose that actually inhibit white cell function so what are we doing we're having more alcohol to drink we're calling uh, grog shops and takeaway uh, food essential services and people having more junk food in the midst of a COVID crisis we know that sunlight's integral to our immune system, yet we're all getting locked down and closing ourselves in building. We know that exercise is critical to our immune system. I'm not saying everyone should be outside and you know and, and protesting and stuff like that, but we should all be outside getting some sunlight and vitamin D. And if you're looking around, you know, there's there's good research out there saying that vitamin D is critical to our immune system. And whether or not you're having it supplementary or my preference is <clears throat> appropriate sunlight. So we can, we can improve our immune systems overnight by reducing our insulin intake or insulin production, not drinking alcohol. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, as I get a dry cough from talking for too long here and, um, and from, from eating well. And so we've got so much control over our outcomes. Yet if you listen to the press, you know, we're worried about this hidden virus, which is running around on an aerosol and droplets when you can improve your health and your immune function within 12 hours. So, I, you know, I, I, I'm not a teetotaler, but I've had one glass of red wine in six months. And, um, uh, and I'm definitely low carving and I'm losing my voice, so I'm just going <clears> to... <throat> it, it, it's certainly it's a message of empowerment. Um, um, you know, and, 
when you understand the the biochemistry as you break it down, it, it really is a simple equation. Um, you know, in, in the mouth, you know, it, all roads lead to to the to the same place. You know, we we see the tooth decay, we see the gum disease, and and the link between you know chronic inflammation in the in the body and periodontal disease uh, with with type two diabetics is just inarguable. And um, you know, this fueling um, this process, as you describe it so well. You know, it it really I think it helps people to kind of paint this picture. Um, you know, thank you so much for the way you 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 really dive into the science first. You know, as a surgeon, it, it I think it's incredibly important for people as qualified as yourself to be talking about this because you know it gives you know the layperson hope that there that there is you know real understanding of you know what this is doing to them. Um, and then, you know, then, then there's the practical applications, um, you know, the, the people and the, the patients that you're helping get better. Uh, you know, th this, I think when we talked a few weeks ago, I, I was a little bit, um, I think, you know, I, I was a, a little bit, you know, reflective on saying, you know, I, I can't believe we're still talking about this, you know, that we haven't got anywhere. And you kind of propped me up in, in saying that, um, you know, well, this, this has progressed, which it has. So, you know, I'm hopeful that that this is going to move forward, and that people like yourself, you know, is, are making real changes in the world. And you know, we, we've seen this, you know, since you know we met in 2016, that this is this is happening. So, what what would you like to see happen in the in the you know the next five years in terms of you know your mission and, and Gary Fetker's impact on the world? My impact's pretty simple. I've planted about thirteen thousand trees, and they're they're going to outlive me. And um, a few of us were talking about this recently at, at, at a meeting when we were still allowed to meet. And um, we won't, the, the people who started the anti-smoking campaigns, you know, we won't be remembered, but um, we'll sit back in our um, rocking chairs in some respects. Um, and I'm older than you, so I'll get there before you. And um, just go, yeah, that was a bit of fun, wasn't it? So, um, this, is not, this is not an individual thing. This is about the fact that we've, we, that we, and this Belinda, Belinda's work is amazing, and you know I, I recommend people look up her stuff and <clears throat> her lectures on YouTube. If we've raised awareness beyond our backyard, then then we've done the right thing. And so um, it's a journey; we're all on it. But that look of joy and empowerment when people get their lives back into control is, you know, that that's that's immeasurable, and that's what we're in it for. Because I'm guaranteed there's no money in it. There's no money in it. It's certainly, yeah, it's, it's a message of hope, yeah, and I hope, you know, people take you know, take that from this and, and your story as well, the persistence and the, you know, the the, the sometimes the, the dog and stubborn, stubbornness to really kind of press through for the truth. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I'm quoted, I, I say this over and over, once you see the benefits, you can't unsee them. Once you see the conflicts of interest, you can't unsee them. And all you can do as an individual is trial it for yourself. It doesn't matter how many papers are written or because everything's biased in medical literature. I mean, that, that's another talk I did last year. But once you see it for yourself, there's no one that can tell you that you don't feel better. You know, if you, if you feel better, and someone says, no, you can't, you're not feeling better. That's just complete BS. And so that if patients, patients, individuals, you don't have to be a patient, you don't have to be sick. People say, look, I don't feel as bloated. I don't have headaches and I'm, and I'm not as tired. I'm not getting an afternoon lag. I'm not crashing. I've, I've got better control of my weight and my cravings and eating. Then then what what better outcome there is there for people from taking back control of their life <clears throat> at a time in society when control has been taken away from us? So with, yeah. with all the stuff happening around you, I say to people that you've got, you might not be able to control your finances, the government, <clears throat> what's happening with your kids, bank loans and all that sort of thing. What you have total control of is what you're going to eat this afternoon or not eat. That's it. And that's often the first step putting it I, and a lot of people are down a deep, dark hole at the moment. And I said, here's a ladder. Here's a ladder. You might want to put your foot on it. But what you eat this afternoon is your first foot on that ladder. And 
I mean, I love that. I like that analogy because I see people hop, put their first foot on the ladder and take back a little bit of control, and then take it back a little bit more. And it doesn't have to be cra- You know, you don't have to go hardcore at it. You know, and you just just a little bit of control. Sure, sure. Gary, I know you've Gary, got to run. Right. Right. There's just a question from from the audience. Would you like to call it now? Would you like to take the question? Yeah, we'd, we'd take it. Yeah, go for it. Sure. Okay, so does Dr. Fekker have recommendations for someone with type 1 diabetes? Absolutely. I mean, it, 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 I come back to that definition, and that's type 1, type 2, <coughs> type 3, which is dementia, is an inability to control the blood, uh, the, the carbohydrate load that you present the body with. So if you have type 2 diabetes, you're often insulin resistant. person with type 1 diabetes doesn't. Uh, produce enough insulin to control it. So if you reduce the amount of carbohydrate intake that you have, you reduce the amount of insulin that you actually need to inject. And that's called the law of small numbers by Richard Bernstein. Um, if you, There's a group called Type 1 Grit on Facebook. You can look them up, T-Y-P-E-O-N-E-G-R-I-T. Um, I'm very proud to be part of that in its early formation days. That's got thousands of type 1 patients who are running low carb and the children in that are the best 0.3% controlled type 1s in the world. 0.3%. 80% of them have got normal HbA1c's, which is phenomenal because if you know someone with type B's, normally their life is a roller coaster of poorly controlled blood glucose, complications at young ages, going blind, kidney disease, losing limbs. And that, that's normally a write-off disaster. And this group are the best 0.3% controlled in the world. And all they've done is reduce their carbohydrate. It's always recommended to do that under medical supervision because when you reduce your, your carbohydrate load, you will need to reduce your insulin levels at the same insulin intake. You will need to reduce medication. That's really with type two as well. So if you go low carb and you fast, and particularly some of the modern medications called the gliptins. They, they're associated with complications. But, yeah, look, low-carb, type 1, type 2, brilliant results. Should be the first line of management. Gary, it's been an absolute pleasure today. Thank you very much for joining us and sharing your wisdom. I look forward to talking again. And, um, you know, all the best to you and the family. S- send out our best wishes to Belinda and the, your children and the grandkids uh, running around there, keeping you busy, I'm sure. Uh Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to keep it short, yes. <laughs> All right, mate. Well, okay. keep keep very well in Tasmania there. Um, actually, if you just want to share quickly where people can find you at, at nofructose.com and any other pages. Uh, so my website, nofructose.com, completely out of date because I'm too busy. <clears throat> Belinda's got one called isupportgary.com, which is really about the politics <clears throat> and the vested interests. Um, and we're both on Twitter. Um, Gary Fetke, Belinda Fetke on Fructose No. Um, her Facebook page is um, Belinda Fetke No Fructose. We're on Instagram as well, but you know, most of our up-to-date agitation, I suppose, and, and you know, keeping people aware is on Twitter. So both of us are there. And, uh, and you can subs- subscribe through Belinda's website to our to a newsletter. But with, I, I, so we're just a couple of state school kids trying to make a difference, you know, going back. So because this is the right thing to do. Gary, it's, it's always a ple- pleasure and thank you again for all your work. Uh, I look forward to, to chatting again soon. You too, Stephen. Thanks, mate. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.